Hello, everybody. My name is Sashiko Flores, and I'm the operating director and co-founder of CoreDot, and I'm also the moderator for tonight's panel. CoreDot is thrilled to be partnering with the American Conservation Film Festival, ACFF for short, and our panel is going to be talking about specifically in the deaf community about a movie called Public Trust. And this movie is about one and a half hours, and it's a documentary style film that talks about the American system of public lands and the fight to protect those lands. And I'm happy to introduce our panel today, who has had various experiences of conservation and public lands. We just wanted to talk about our reactions and our reflections about the film and our past experiences as well. I'll go ahead and take the time to introduce each panelist. Take about three to five minutes to talk about who you are, your uh, experience with the outdoor fields, and your current position. We'll start with Sam Bragg. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Bragg. I was born and raised in Maine, so I had a lot of woodsy kinds of experiences and I was always out in the nature. I grew up with a family who really was involved with agriculture. Uh, my family is the seventh generation farmers. Uh, my grandparents have land that is, you know, we have hundreds of acres. We've done fishing and hunting and growing, harvesting and um, even growing our own food that we've eaten. Uh, in high school, I started though to be really involved with environmental science and the science classes I was really motivated to be involved with. Um, and there was a challenge though, because of language access. Um, I was in a mainstream school at that time. Um, the, the school that I was going to that was a deaf school was closed. So I had to go to a hearing school which was mainstream between deaf and hearing students. I had an interpreter with me um, most of the time and I did my best. Um, I then went to Gallaudet University. I majored in several different things, but I always was involved with um, envir the environment. And also there was a club called Green Gallaudet, which was a sustainability club. Um, also was involved with student government but again, I was always involved with the environment. And I think that was because of the values that I was raised with and the environment that I was also raised in. Uh, so I decided to get involved with Conservation Corps. And that was a couple years ago. I've though always loved the outdoors. I've always loved camping and hiking. Uh, my backyard was a forest, literally. So I could always just go in my backyard and take a hike and be in the forest. Uh, but I never thought that I would live in the forest for a whole summer. And sure enough, that's what I did. I lived in a tent for a entire summer. And I just thought to myself, I wanted to be involved with that somehow. So I went back to Gallaudet, graduated, and I found a way to be involved with the outdoors in some way. Um, I've been to the Aspen camping, um, I've been an outdoor instructor, and I decided for my graduate schooling that I wanted to be involved with St. Brick University. And they had a leadership school pertaining to outdoor um, activities and leadership. So I got involved with that. I. Um, did several expeditions involving water uh, sports. I did outdoor um, types of activities as well. So that was almost three years ago. And then AmeriCorps, I became AmeriCorps uh, member and worked with their archivery group. And actually that happened this, the first time this summer, I helped fund their outdoor program and found it as well. So I played different roles in that sense I've always really enjoyed backpacking recreationally and just being outdoors. So I don't wanna go on and on, but that's just a brief summary of who I am and my experience. Beautiful, thank you so much. Yes, that, that was a really in-depth background. So we'll kick it over to Sophia. 
Hi. Hey, I'm Sophia Hugh, and I'm from Pennsylvania. Um, I've lived in DC for the last four years and a half. And Sam really went in depth about their experience. And for me, I'm going to do the opposite. Um, I'm new to this type of environmental conservation. Um, I've never done any real camping or backpacking until I moved to DC and got involved with the EPA. So again, that was about four and a half years ago. I was exposed first time to go to my first camping trip and I just can't tell you how much I, I enjoyed it. Um, the camaraderie there, the just hiking together, sharing food, uh, just hanging out together out in the outdoors. So that was my first experience. And then I got involved with REI and got a, you know, a gift certificate to REI and bought all the stuff that you need and just went wild with that. Um, so I just got right into it. And a friend of, at work was exposing me to rock climbing and backpacking and camping, like I was mentioning, and cooking, you know, figuring how to make a fire and cook food out in the outdoors. Um, but before that, I, again, I never had that experience. So, like I was saying, just being more involved with um, Core that. Core that and the exposure that it gave me. And then um, after that first experience, I um, became an outdoor ambassador. And I started hosting events monthly and just spreading awareness about the environment, um, the ethics of environmental conservation. Uh, providing workshops, going camping, instructing, you know, biking, hiking, and pretty much you name it. Um, meeting other people who had the same values and enjoyed these types of adventures. Um, of course, being involved with the community and kind of being able to disconnect from this electronic world. So that that's what this has done for me at last, at least, is to be able to kind of ground myself to be yeah, just to be able to ground myself to the earth and just to be able to have real in-depth good relationships with people. Thank you so much for that. We'll kick it over to Cynthia. And hi, my name is Cynthia Benson and I'm from Minnesota. And in my experience, I grew up and I was born in Liberia. And so my family and I really lived out in the rural areas and we didn't have internet or phone or technology. And so we've always enjoyed the outdoors and being out in the rural country. So moving had a, you know, there was a very different experience in Minnesota. There wasn't a lot of outdoor uh, activities that we really enjoyed doing. And so I stayed at home all the time. And one of my professors or teachers, you know, suggested that I should apply for CCM, which is the Conservation Corps from Minnesota. And so in 2011, I, I joined and I was, I enjoyed myself. And so I stayed there for 2011 to 2013. And I became a leader for the youth crew. And, and we worked at an island called Isle Royale National Park. And so you know, since then, we I haven't worked there since, but I have graduated and and have moved on from there. But, you know, I'm just trying to figure out what to do next. And, you know, I wanted to study more environmentalism in college. And so I decided, you know, what do I want to do on the weekends? So I decided, well, I can go to state parks and go to hikes and, you know, not just have to go to one spot, but go to all, all the different spots and you know checking out different national parks with friends and you know especially people who can use asl and and we can really enjoy ourselves being out, outdoors together awesome thank you let's pass it over to sarah hi everyone it's really nice to meet you all and to have this discussion i uh, really appreciate that uh now i Nesohaki? I've been involved with a Nesohaki uh, tribe, which is in Iowa, where I am right now. And I've been pretty much involved with that tribe 
since I've been a, a little child, um, my whole life, really. So the culture of the tribe, the elders, traditions that have been passed on to me, and um, family values. We, we grew our own food, we were farmers, and we had strong belief in organic food and to growing our own food at home. We've grown our own corn, which is a particular type of corn that you've probably seen. They have different colors of corn. Indian corn. Indian corn, which is purple. And it really actually does taste quite, quite nicely, really. Um, so that's what I think of when I think about me growing up with my family and the tribe that I was raised in. We would get together and go into what we call the longhouse. And we would, what we call, we would wick it up in a sense. We would get together in a structure, um, in a, a building basically, and cook together, um, share the food together, and have a feast basically. We would create a feast as a community. We would have, um, the fruit and, and harvest from the farm that we, we were involved with, unfortunately, um, because of not being able to afford the farm, we lost the farm. However, we were able to try to get some of the animals back. Um, so again, we did our best. We established our school within our tribe and other entities like that. Um, but again, we were very much big on farming. We grew our own food and we were able to have all of us in our tribe eat from the food that we created. So I've been involved with protecting the land called Standing Rock. There have been big, um, companies trying to come in to put in their oil pipes and to uh, do all of those kinds of uh, things. So they try to put in the pipelines and do the fracking and all that, so. With the Dakota Access Pipeline, specifically. So we have been involved with fighting them to put those oil pipelines in. In North Dakota. In North Dakota. And um, we call ourselves water protectors because we believe that the water is sacred and it's sacred for our land and for the people. 75% of the land is water. And as far as our bodies as well, we are full of water. So we need to be able to protect this water and protect the water from the people who are quite, as I may say, selfish to try to get their oil and things like that, which then pollutes the water. So we decided we need to do something to, to protect our land. Um, we know that we have to think about our future and the children of our, the children of our tribe. So thank you so much. Thank you. Lastly, we have Chase. Hi, yes, yeah, thank you. It's an honor to be with you all. My name is Chase Burton and I'm a filmmaker and I live in Los Angeles. I grew up in Southern California near a beach in a small town called Ventura. And I think I was really fascinated with the environment because you know I was a mainstream student in second grade and many of the students had parents who worked in uh, ocean conservation groups. And so often we would go out on field trips and join in and go on boats and, and be able to see whales and uh, different islands and we, we could go walk on the islands. And I, I remember that feeling and thinking, wow, this is, you know, just like Sarah said, this is one life that we have and, you know, one planet. So what, what are we going to do with that? And so I got, you know, into filmmaking and uh, I decided to combine those ideas together. And so thinking about recreation, I think recreation is key and to try and catch people's attention into conservation. So I went into film school after high school and I moved to South America in Ecuador. And so 
so I was involved with the Waironori tribe and I stayed with them for about two weeks and lived their life and, and their lifestyle by the Amazon River. And so then I jumped over to Jamaica where I stayed with deaf children in Jamaica and got to see their lifestyle there as well. And then I went into Australia for a year and studied with the Aboriginal uh, people in Australia. So that really made me think about, uh, you know, the relationship with nature and how we can portray that in film, um, how we have, you know, cosmic levels and we have mineral landscapes and, and that's really my passion. And so I decided in 2017 to make a film called Mather. And we rented one, one piece of land that was this dry lake bed and that was located in Coyote Dry Lake. And we tried to follow the principles of Burning Man. And they have those eight principles where you follow the conservation of the land, uh, no impact on the land. So we really focused on making a film with the least amount of impact on the land as possible. Then once we were done making that film, and the film itself was, you know, it could be very wasteful with all the food we consume and the gas. And so we try to offset our impact on the land. And I think we were pretty successful in making this film and, and making the film very beautifully uh, visual with, with nature. And so I, that was a really good experience. And I really want to continue those type of projects for the rest of my life. Wow, amazing panelists. I'm really excited to hear about all these different backgrounds from water protector to someone who just enjoys recreation in the outdoors. And so it's nice to see the diversity in our panel. So now that we've talked about our experiences, I want to ask you all about your feelings about the film itself. Um, again, the, the movie was called Public Trust. Does anybody want to share your thoughts about your initial feelings about that film? And anyone can start. And Sarah, did you want to say something? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, I watched the film, the entire film, and um, I have to say I, I got a little angry. And there were other times that I, I just, I just really feel like I connected to the movie. Um, and I wanted to like fight for the land because that is, you know, the land that we are trying to fight for as well. Um, now, some of the people there, I just there was a politician that said uh, these are not our people, but we are we are the people, and that really offended me. And we are here, and we we've been around. So, I mean, I cried. I cried for that woman. Uh, I mean saying that, oh, they're not their people. I just, I just, I'm just done with a white man taking over everything and, and colonizing everything and capitalism. And it's just, I just felt, I knew, I, I know the experience of this movie. It shows the people and, and it's accurate that these things are still happening today, even today, it's just, I don't know why people just want to, you know, put it under the rug and act like it's this hasn't happened. But we're in 2021 now. You can't just ignore the ocean. You know, you you can't ignore the indigenous people. You you just can't. But um, I felt like we need to take some action and and speak loudly in that sense and and be loud in what we need to do. So thanks for letting me share. I just, yeah. it, it really, I was really upset. I was angry. Yeah, keep that fire in you. I mean, this is the point of the panel is to really discuss about this because this, this is an opportunity for our deaf community to talk about their thoughts uh, about the film. Does anyone else want to share? Uh, uh, this Sophia? Is, yeah, yeah. Um, I think really, Sarah, you, you, you summarized that quite well. I felt that, you know, the, the Alaskan native people, I mean, that was their life. They, um, their livelihood totally depends on the animals, the outdoors, you know, and, but there's oil that comes in and pollution that, that 
has occurred. And just, I just can't imagine you're having your whole life dependent on the environment. And then these oil companies come in and they try to do these things just to, you know, better themselves financially and to, to benefit economically. And I guess that's something I appreciated I appreciate about my work. I work as a scientist at the EPA and um, I work with antimicrobials. Um, so there's chemicals that are in the environment and now in our water, in the air. Um, and are these chemicals safe for humans? Are they safe for animals? Are they safe for the plants that we grow. So that's, that's something we really need to look more closely at because there's, there's risks there. So that movie really talked about things that are really happening. There's pesticides that, and these chemicals that really do affect our environment. And I know that you know, all of our work is essential and important, but just to see a different perspective and the in-depth that it went in, um, that movie really made me appreciate, made me appreciate the environment through the work that I do. And it, it's, it's work, but it's actually kind of fun too. But um, I really did go in depth about those things. I'm wondering if you've seen other outdoor films with, it could be a range of, you know, festivals, or maybe you watch some kind of Netflix film or anything, you know, a film related to the outdoors. Have you all experienced watching that? Yes. Cynthia said yes. Cynthia, did you want to share more? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen some. Um, I've seen one where they, you know, they try to follow different policies like, you know, outdoor camping or hiking. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I've seen boating and canoeing and uh, so seeing that, you know, thinking about, you know, food and how how food can be spoiled and and if we have too much food and they just kind of uh they have to be trashed and and left out to be spoiled and so i did you know get together with a group of people to discuss that and we went out uh outside to find some food and and you know you know there was like a hidden party uh where there's trash and recycling there and so you know telling them, oh, you, you don't need to throw this away. You can actually recycle it and, and stuff like that. I know, Chase, you have, you know, a little bit of experience with filmmaking. So have you seen any outdoor films? Uh, sure. I actually just watched a film called The Biggest Little Farm. And that film talks about a couple who decided to live in L.A. Um, they lived in L.A., but they decided to leave L.A. to go ahead and uh, live on a farm close by. And they didn't realize how much work it was to take care of the land and to see all of the pollution and the trash that was on the land. And, you know, the water situation there was not good. Um, so they hired a third person to come in to kind of observe the land to see how um, they could diversify the ecosystem there. So it took them about five years, four or five years to actually um, turn the farm over into a better space. Um, so that actually reminds me of the public trust film because in that film, there was one person who talked about the land has so much more value than what we realize. And the, the value is what's underneath the land. So they devalued um, the land during the time, but then there are also people there who are looking for a quick profit uh, so they have to think about those two different types of actions and then the sustainability of both. Um, there was a virus um, involved as well, but um, there were businesses who were trying to um, get control of the land. And um, I think it was just really frustrating to see that, to see how the industry profits over even, you know, worrying about the conservation of the land. So I'm really tired of seeing people profit and just really take advantage of the land rather than trying to take care of the land 
and the outdoors to allow it to last as long as possible. But, you know, they're talking about quick wins and quick profits. And I just felt like that film helped me make the connection between those two different um, entities. And it's just a very powerful movie. Yeah, so speaking about the movie, I know, Sam, you've watched many, many different movies. So I wanted to ask you about your perspective. Do you feel, you know, in the outdoor films, do you think it's accessible, especially with captioning? Um, well, I wanted to mention the indie documentaries um, often may show, you know, the, there's, you know, the company Panagonia, they do short films that are often shown even YouTube, there are different channels of YouTube um, that you can um, look at different hikers and their journeys. So those types of films, they do have auto captioning. Well, they might, but is it fully accessible to what everyone is saying? And the, you know, the grammar is correct and the spelling. No, the spelling's often off. Um, the spelling of a word might be something completely different than what the intention of the film was. The producers are hearing producers. Um, they're thinking of their audience being a hearing audience, not anyone else per se. Um, there are a lot of documentaries that are- With narrators uh, speaking. And the narrators that are speaking and that makes me feel quite disconnected because I'm listening to, I'm trying to watch them speak at the same time, me as a deaf person, um, I do, I mean, the captioning, work some of the time, but 100% of the time um, in a way that I feel connected as who I am? No, not always. I don't think there's always access there. Yeah, so how many of you have seen deaf-made films that are about the outdoors? Mm, no, never. Yeah, go ahead, Chase. Yeah, I think in the deaf community, I've noticed that there are many that there's a, a lot of privilege about, you know, film education because, you know, films aren't cheap. And so filmmakers try to get into the movie industry and, and the movie industry is not very accessible. You know, even with me, I've, I've struggled to have accessibility in the film industry and I'm in my thirties. So, you know, I realized that I need to set up my own company and do it my way because, you know, I mean, I've been working on that for the past 10 years. But I, I realized that, you know, many sets and, and other film industry uh, things are not accessible. And so it, that translates into their movies. If I can add, um, the film industry is really not accessible, but the outdoor industry is also really inaccessible. And then when we have these two worlds collide together, there's, there's a double barrier there. And the indigenous as well. I've noticed that there's, you know, accessibility for indigenous people is not there either. And, you know, especially things that are talking about the environment and the land and things that we're trying to protect and, you know, earth and as, as water protectors and as uh, protectors for mother earth, you know, I, I do recognize that, you know, there's not enough accessibility for us and not enough representation. And it seems like we're always being left out. So, you know, like, like we've been mentioning, it would be great that we could work more together and, and, and recognize those, you know, and, and make sure that the community is, you know, having access to that knowledge because they don't have that access right now. And so, and I've seen that. And I've, I've been involved with Staining Rock and, you know, there's, I have to make vlogs and, you know, to talk about things to try and, you know, encourage people to come out. And I realized that the deaf community really didn't have access to that information. Yeah, I know that we all have a different range of experiences. I know some people really experience, you know, by heart, uh, working with the outdoors and parks. And, and I know some people are just new and they're just now learning about what it's like to be in the outdoors. So my question to you is, you know, how do you get access to information specifically about environmental issues or conservation or anything outdoor specific? How do you get access to that information? Um, I, I, well, I'm fairly new, I'd say, uh, to 
the environment and conservation. Um, now I've been learning a lot through my coworkers. I, I have a coworker who's actually a good friend of mine and um, they actually learned American Sign Language for me. They, they took some lessons and, it, and I can understand them quite well as far as lip reading. So I may feel connected to them and they've brought me to uh, camping trips. And I think if I didn't have that kind of um, language access with someone else there, um, speaking the same language that I know, I, I don't know how, I mean, I, it's allowed me to, to enjoy myself camping. And, and, but again, I think language access is key to me to be able to connect to the environment and to, you know, I mean, we have corpse that, and we have um, people who can use American Sign Language and um, I have access in that way. Um, when there is a hearing type of agency or hearing based agency, there are a lot of barriers there. I don't have that access. Yeah, I wanted to make another comment. I had a friend, uh, their fiance, who owns, uh, a, is part of a tribe. And so I, I've been learning from them. And so, you know, just learning about the, you know, the history of the land and the tribe that lived on that land and, uh, you know, working for the environment. And so I've been learning more about, you know, as a student learning from from this tribe and their family and and learned a lot and so that's how I was taught you know especially with boating and and hiking and you know what type of you know gear to wear what type of backpack uh, you know I really learned those specific details from them and I, I've learned a lot from them and so finally I reached out to uh, it was a it's a hiker so I, I work with an, an ASL hiking group and so we got together and we decided to uh, to set a time to go out and hike and so we were corresponding through email and we went over to the state park and and went on this hike and so you know we talked about water is important and what backpack to use and and important healthy foods to bring for snacks and uh, you know because some people don't know what a hiking backpack should look like or uh, what is um you know boating b-o-w-a like what does that mean what does it look like you know what is how do you camp how do you set up a tent um, th those are many examples of things that we had to learn together Oh, Sam, did you want to add something? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm thinking of two different thoughts um, as far as outdoor experiences and backpacking. I've been doing more of my own research. It's a good thing though, because I do love to read. I do love to do research. That's just something I, I enjoy doing. Um, again, I, my family is seventh generation deaf. So I've had access to learning um, in a language that I understand and that I have access to through my parents and through my family to learn about agriculture, to learn about um, camping and to learn about the outdoors. So I've always been able to learn on my own in that sense. And then I've had access uh, growing up from my deaf family. Yeah, so my next question is, you know, we were talking about accessibility and inaccessibility. So we, we've seen this movie, there was captioning and you know we've had some other background exposure to this topic now that you've learned this information how do you think that you can educate other people especially people who might not have that background knowledge or may not be able to read some of the captioning because maybe the captioning is not as accessible to uh, other deaf individuals and so how how do you think that you can engage other people and, and try to explain that information to them Um, I know that when I'm seeing the captioning, there's a lot of errors in it. And someone may ask me, you know, what, what do you mean? What, what do those things mean? So, um, you know, even certain words like the, the term store, um, it's just, again, the captioning is laughable in a sense, but it, it's really not accurate. Um, and then talking about 
the captioning as well. Um, they may misspell something and it looks like it says America, but then I look at the film and I'm thinking to myself, I don't know, that doesn't seem like they're talking about America. Um, so it gives me doubt as to what is really being portrayed. Uh, so there are errors in the captioning for sure. And you know, what I do is I start talking about it. Um, you know, and I may say, you know, give a person an example and educate them in what I think the captioning is saying. Um, there are some interpreters as well. Um, and I may even talk with uh, people in who I'm trying to educate and talk about, you know, what is happening in America um, and that the captioning is not accurate some of the times. So that's what I think I do. Yeah, good catch. Cynthia. Yeah, I was, um, you know, after I've learned all, all of this from my own background, you know, thinking about all those pesticides and things that kill plants, you know, I'm not a chemist. And, you know, my family has taught me several things about that. And so learning about how to grow lettuce and using pesticides or herbicides that can kill them I learned to avoid that and, and some things that can cause cancer. And so, you know, those things I, I have learned not to expose myself to. And so, you know, trying to, to reconcile with things that I have learned that I should avoid. Anybody you want to add anything before I get to the next question? Um, I'm thinking in a way we can, how we do educate the deaf community. Of course, we want to make things more visual um, and make sure that things are, you know, things are portrayed in American Sign Language to be able to have that access. So to again, to provide that language access in American Sign Language uh, to teach people uh, through our own language. Um, I'd like to make, I'd like to see more deaf filmmakers out there get involved with the industry and make more vid videos that are accessible and more matching to people as, you know, other people like our deaf community. So deaf people do see the world through a different lens than hearing people. And I think we would benefit from having these films and, and education in that perspective. Yeah, and I wanted to add a little bit to that. I've noticed with sign language, uh, you can actually make it accessible with a voiceover. So hearing people can still watch and listen while people are signing on the screen. Whereas if a hearing person is speaking and then it's translated to captioning, it's sometimes the point doesn't get across because there's a little bit of a language barrier. Mm -hmm. Often people uh, aren't uh, fluent in English as their first language. And so for me, I've been trying to focus more on the visuals instead of trying to add all these words in sign language. I like it to be just very accessibly visible uh, films. And I think that's a great thing to show because it, it, you know, pictures are always stick in your mind more than words. You know, words don't really stick in your brain as well as, as those visuals. That's true. So now we're talking about visibility. Um, and again, with visuals, we know that deaf people uh, have visual, they're more in tune with their visuals. So thinking about how do you feel, uh, you know, the panels or the, the interviewers, the people that were interviewed in the film, um, you know, I noticed that there is a high percentage of white men that were interviewed. Uh, do you think that impacts the movie's message? Definitely. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, talking about what if we, what if they interviewed more um, BIPOC people or just a more diverse uh, interview, how would that impact the film differently? I see head nods. So how can you, do you mind expanding more about your thoughts? Sure. Yeah. To see those white men being interviewed, they're showing their own opinions. Um, but we need more diversity. We, we keep seeing the same old white, white male out there saying the same old thing, but we need to see other people's perspectives and diversity out there for sure. 
um, yeah, you know, I, when I was watching the movie, I noticed that there, there was a lot of white, able-bodied men that were being interviewed. So, and, and there is nothing wrong with that. But again, the connection wasn't there. There wasn't, you know, feeling like, okay, we have an understanding. Um, you know, I, I think about the movie Crazy Rich Asians. Uh, before that movie came out, I didn't realize how important it was to have uh, Asians be represented in films. And, you know, that's something that I totally overlooked. And I, I you know, I would watch films and then finally seeing Crazy, H Crazy Rich Asians, I felt totally connected. And I realized that that representation really mattered. And, and I saw that my race, my culture was portrayed in media. So that was really important. And so, you know, establishing that BIPOC trust and, you know, see, seeing yourselves in films make you want to connect more and, and support them more. That's true. Sarah, I know you wanted to add something. Yeah, actually, yes. Um, what I was thinking in mind was, you know, I, I'm kind of done with the white man system. It, it, it's prevalent. Um, I see movies and, and it's all about white men. And, um, you know, there's not a lot of diversity. I don't see um, BIPOC representation and I really didn't see a lot of female representation as well. I think there was one female that was interviewed. So again, it's more than that. We should be able to engage other people, other types of people. Um, we have you know, a lot of different tribes. We have, um, a lot of different types of people that need to be represented. Um, it's not just, you know, about oil even. Um, there's a lot of different perspectives out there and why aren't we highlighting the, those perspectives? Um, and then those, you know, in California talking about the water bottles and how our water is being taken away from us. So again, I just think there's a lot more that can be represented out there. Any additional comments before we move on to the next question? No? Um, I would just say that I would agree that we definitely have to have more diversity of perspectives. Yeah, I just, I feel like, you know, again, there wasn't that connection. I didn't feel that connected and, and you know, seeing a you know, diverse cast, you're able to connect more. And, and especially when it talks about the land and the water, you know, we, we think about, we want that diversity of perspectives. Yeah, yeah, of course, connection is very important. And I, I think to me, and maybe you feel the same, but it's a big duh moment. It's kind of like, yeah, of course, we need more diversity. We need more representation. We need all these things. And, you know, still to this day in 2021, we're still facing so many different barriers. And, and for so many years, you know, we have different acts that, you know, are supposed to work with um, a disability community or the deaf community and okay, they pull in interpreters, but that's still not enough. And then, you know, talking about an act, um, are you familiar with an act called the Great American Outdoors Act? No. Okay, well, I know I'm, I'm kind of picking on Sam a little bit, but I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit um, maybe I can share, then you can share. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I don't follow politics that closely, but this act is really nice. I was wondering if Sam, you could expand more about what it is. Uh, really, I don't know every part of that act and I, I don't really follow 100% uh, parliamentary procedure um, but talking about public lands, we should have more public lands um, that stay public. Uh, as an example, there are some areas uh, that I'm thinking of, like Keton, Maine. They're part of that particular bill that they want the lands that are public lands currently to stay public lands. And for it, those lands or that space to be under the state. However, again, just staying public lands for recreation, environmental purposes. Um, but do I understand the nitty gritty, like all the details of the bill? Um, not so much, just a general concept. Yeah, I've just noticed that this act has been coming up a lot 
uh, recently. And I know this film was, you know, leading up to 2020. I remember at that very end, they kind of showed the, um, you know, the fight and then this, you know, success and then the backslide and then having to start all over and then, you know, working again and then having to backslide again. And so again, there's always those ups and downs. And so I'm wondering if, you know, in a deaf perspective or in the hard of hearing perspective, um, you know, with your fight for your rights and then having to, you know, backtrack again and then starting over and feeling stuck and having to be pushed back and then having this, you know, getting in this stuck, stuck in this cycle. I was wondering if you all feel that way. Like maybe you could give me an example if you felt that way. Yeah, sure, I, I can. Um, I mean, it just happened to me last year in 2020. I was in Iowa. And the person's name is Kimberly Wolf. I was um, uh, with Kimberly Wolf. Um, they didn't provide interpreters for me. There was no access for me to go to this uh, conference. So I kind of had to speak up and ask them to at least provide me an interpreter. Two months later, uh, there was no interpreter that showed up. And I thought, again, I have to fight for this again. Then they said, okay, that they would provide an interpreter on the screen. So, um, but that didn't, that wasn't a, a permanent fix per se. I had to actually fight for that again. So I talked to Kimberly and I don't think Kimberly thought it was a big deal, um, but I guess, you know, I'll, the deaf community has to continually to act loud and, and and I just noticed this struggle or this pattern that we still have to deal with. Um, things seem to be getting a little better, but it's still a struggle. It's still a battle that we all have to face. I know we got just a couple minutes left. I, you know, wanted to have some last minute reflection or comment about as, you know, deaf community members, how can we act? How can we protect our land? And maybe it's a little bit of a too deep question. It might be a little deep. <laughs> well, I mean, I, it might have something to do with my work because I'm a filmmaker and a producer. I'm very committed to experimenting with different ways of how I can impact somebody or impact the environment. I know that I've always tried to lessen my carbon footprint and know that it's okay that we can't, I can't reduce it completely, but I can offset it enough or even better. So, and I can do that in my personal life as well. Um, I know for myself without a corporation or the corporation stepping up to do their part, um, it's, it's tough because if we look at the big picture and, and trying to make a change somehow to shift more focus on um, more wisely using our resources, um, it's just, it's a way that, I don't know, you have to uh, be able to be smarter and if people are happier, then maybe there's a way to make the world happier in that sense. So, yeah. Okay, and I also wanted to talk a little bit about actions. I know we're all involved with the outdoors in different ways, whether that's recreation or, you know, any kind of, you know, group setting. What is your message to the deaf community, uh, either about public trust or just about outdoor films in general? How do you, what's your message to the deaf community who may not know or may not have access to that specific educational topic um, in, in terms with the environment? Uh, I can. Hold on one second. Well, we can't all talk at the same time. Cynthia, maybe Cynthia, and then we'll switch over to Sarah. 
Oh, okay. Uh, thinking about access to the land, that all it's the the parks and the public trusts are there for everyone to enjoy and to get out there. I mean, to take advantage of being out there in the outdoors and to see how much fun it, it really is. I just am thinking about access to the land and that access should be for all people. Access to any parks, boating, any types of outdoor experiences, that people are allowed to be anywhere, to be outdoors for enjoyment as well, backpacking, hiking, boating. Those are just some examples that I'm, you know, can kind of think of. So to summarize, you're trying to encourage deaf people to be outside to, to really feel that connection to, to the earth. Yeah. Exactly. Sarah, did you want to add more? Yeah. So, you know, I would tell the community to just take better care of our mother nature and our, our land, you know, take care of our stuff, like growing plants at home and growing your own backyard garden, um, you know, water, protecting the water, you know, getting outside and just breathing the fresh air, you know. Um, you know, if you see any, you know, local spots that are, they're fighting for their land, try and get involved, get to know them and get to know the issue and why it's important to take care of that land. And, you know, if you're biking, you know, try to bike instead of using the car if you live in a city. Uh, I think that's all. Great, Kate. Uh, through my career, I've seen a lot of people ask me if I mind helping them create a film. And sometimes I'm like, whoa, you know, it's, it, I have, to, I'm only just one person. And, you know, even these days with this phone, um, it's just, it's really all you need. You really only need an iPhone and to use the iPhone camera, but the world is really yours to, to film in that way. It's, just start with something small, do a two or three minute video about something that you're passionate about and share it with people. And then people will respond to it and then go make part two or part three or even part four and expand upon what you're trying to share. But start small. And then if you feel a passion about it, make more films. It's, it's there at your disposal. I think it, the hardest part is some people don't know exactly how to start. But once you get that type of feedback and you know what your audience wants, then you can start from there. And then from a small video, you can, it can grow bigger and bigger and bigger and you can actually show your ideas to the world, just starting with just a small video um, and be able to spread that throughout the world um, long-term. Yeah, and I wanted to add, uh, I teach backpacking classes for core dads. And the most frequent question that I get asked or more of a concern is that, you know, is it risky? Is it, is it scary for a deaf person to be out alone? And I think that gear is often the number one concern that comes up in class. And my tip for that is, of course, fear is normal. It's good to question and it's good to collect information before you get yourself out into the unknown. Because if you go out into the unknown, that is, it is, um, you know, destabilizing and, and it does feel like, you know, do I know enough to be able to be successful in the situation? So again, be open to ask questions and ask your community and use social media. Of course, social media is impactful, Facebook, and, and, you know, you can even make a page, you can make discussions with other people and you can have information in ASL and you can start your own trip. It's, so I know it is scary, but again, reach out, take some classes, read more, maybe watch some videos and really try to gather that information so that you can, you know, start small. Maybe you could start with a day hike or, um, you know, even just in your neighborhood, if there's a city park nearby, go out there and, and, and start small and, and start building from there. It's possible. Maybe Sophia? Uh, just wanted to add um, to what was just said 
So again, reaching out to the community. I have, if you have friends who are experienced in backpacking, um, ask them if they're interested in taking a hike together. You know, um, that's how I got involved with everything at the EPA. I never thought for a second, um, you know, I didn't have any experience with backpacking and what kind of backpack I should buy. And so I was able to borrow some of the equipment from some of my coworkers and, a, you know, I was able to learn about backpacking. Uh, so, you know, networking, I think is really important. Getting together with your friends, getting out there with your friends, have fun together, you know? Uh, you might think that you have a passion for the environment or maybe you don't yet. That's okay, go with a couple of good friends, get out there, have a good time, you know, and share your experience and make memories with, with each other and, and be able to recreate those experiences. Yeah, to, to echo what Dan and Sophia was just saying, um, I know an experience this past summer, uh, I got together with my group to go on a canoeing boating trip. And so we were trying to prepare uh, for that trip um, so that we can go to uh, the northern area of Minnesota. And so, you know, we got together and discussed and we actually practiced the canoeing and, you know, got onto a river. And, you know, we did a long practice. We did it all day long and uh, really worked on the canoeing skills. And so, for example, canoeing on one side, uh, realizing that, you know, you had to change the paddle. Uh, and, and so it was, a, it was a good learning process to learn how to, you know, face challenges out in the wilderness, like, for example, wind. So, you know, trying to practice on the strokes and the, and the, and the paddling. So that, I think practice is really great. So if you don't have any experience uh, with canoeing, you can reach out to people and get together and practice together. And so I think that's how that works the best. Beautiful, I think all of your messages all are connected in some way. Uh, for example, starting small and, and building your confidence and you know, build your experiences. I think that's a really fascinating concept. Sophia? Yeah, if I may, I wanted to add a little bit more. Starting small and then feeling good about what you learn. It feels good to learn, you know, and then you almost become addicted to it in a good way. And um, you feel more independent, you have more autonomy with uh, what you're doing. You feel good about it and you reach a point where, you know, I look back and four or so years ago, I had no idea what I was doing. But then fast forward to where I am now, it's, it's great to start to challenge yourself and take those harder hikes now and get to the top of that mountain if that's what you're going for, you know? Exactly. I think that's, that's the beauty of, you know, humanity. It's, it's, you start off alone and you start building and you start getting exposed to other people and you start learning from educational films and, and that all builds together. And, you know, it's not, it's, we don't have all the access to everything. So that's why it does, it does take more time to build our confidence so that we can feel ready to move on to the next part of our journey. And so that's, I really want to thank everybody on this panel for being involved today and, and you know, talking about your experience with watching the film. And, and I really hope that, you know, people will watch this panel and, and I hope they leave thinking about, um, you know, what's it like to be a hearing audience or, or able body people? If, are they, do they actually understand what deaf people go through? I mean, they probably would never understand, but this panel was a really great way to share some of that experience and spread the word a little bit. And, you know, hopefully this does impact some people in the outdoor industry and maybe even the film industry, you know, trying to be more inclusive with the deaf community, especially with ASL and interpreters and, and having this type of discussion. So again, thank you everybody for being involved with this panel. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for hosting it, really. Thank you so much.